set of tutorials, we're going to build a simple Pong game. This tutorial is very different from all the other apps that you've built because several new concepts are going to be introduced. We're going to talk about some of these concepts basically as gaming concepts because they're often used in the creation of other video games, not just Pong. Some of the things we're going to talk about here is the concept of sprites and having a separate canvas on which the sprites move. We're going to talk about how the screen coordinates for your Android phone are different than what you've learned in math class. This will be the first app where we go out of our way to create a separate task. Finally, we're going to build a physics engine, a very simple one, to detect the collision of different sprites and to cause one of them, in our case a ball, to bounce when a collision is detected. We're also going to talk about using the key press events when a user presses a key on the keyboard to trigger the movement of a paddle, which is one of the sprites that we're going to have in our game. So let's get started. Sprites are little animated figures that can be moved around independently. For our simple Pong game, we're going to have two sprites, a paddle and a ball. Even though the ball shown here is a circle, the one we're going to use in our game is going to be a square for reasons we will soon explain. And the canvas that we're going to use can be thought of as a separate piece of paper that's overlaid on the phone screen. In math class, you learn that when you have a coordinate system, 0, 0 is typically shown in the center, and the positive x direction is to the right, while the negative x direction is to the left. Going up along the y-axis yields larger and larger y values, and going below the origin yields negative y values. But in an Android system, as is the case with most gaming systems, we use a slightly different set of coordinates to map positions on the screen. The top left corner of the screen is typically known as the origin, or 0, 0. Similar to our math coordinate system, movements to the right yield larger and larger x-coordinate values. However, one place where Android's coordinate system is different from what you learn in math class is that as we get larger and larger in the Y coordinate system, we go further and further down on the Android screen. Another way of thinking about this is that anywhere in this screen we go, the X and Y coordinates are always positive. Next, we're going to talk about multitasking. What does multitasking mean to you? Looking at this student, you're probably thinking that she's multitasking because she's on the phone at the same time she's writing in her notebook. While that's true, she's doing several other things at once as well. She's sitting on that stoop, she's breathing, she's pressing her right leg against the floor. When humans multitask, we accomplish several things at the exact same time. Computers can also multitask. Here we're looking at a Wikipedia article on multitasking, and it's showing lots of things that a computer can be doing apparently at once. We've got a calculator running here. It's playing a video, we've got a calendar up here at the same time. But it's important to understand the difference between when a computer multitasks versus when a person multitasks. When a computer multitasks, what's really going on is that the computer is taking a task or a single process, bringing it into memory, working on it for a little while, and then putting it back out in memory, and then bringing a new task in. So since these things are happening in series, how come it looks to us like they're all happening at exactly the same time? Well, the reason is that while human beings live in time defined by seconds, computers live in time defined by microseconds, which is a million times smaller in units. In other words, the computer can make it look to us like several things are going on at exactly the same time, but in reality, what's happening is that they're only working on each task for a brief period of time, typically in the millisecond range. In some modern machines, more than one CPU core may be present, and so several things might actually be going on in parallel, that is to say, in exactly the same time. But for the most part, this is still a game and time sharing. It just looks to us as if everything is going on all at once. Although you may not realize it, you've probably built some apps that use multiple tasks. If you've built an app before that used a video player, for example on the soundboard app, the video player runs in a separate task because it plays the speech or the sound 
or the song in human time. It would be unreasonable to expect the computer to freeze all of its processes waiting for that song to finish. Instead, the song is played in a different task and the computer goes along the main thread and continues executing its instructions. In this Pong game, however, this will be the first app where we explicitly go out of our way to define a separate task for the game thread to run. One piece of vocabulary we need to get through is that you'll sometimes see these two terms multitasking and multithreading. While in computer science there are some subtle differences between these two concepts, those differences are outside the scope of this course. In this set of tutorials, as well as in other apps that we make, we will be using these two terms interchangeably. Remember all that physics you learned earlier in high school? Remember thinking you'd never use it again? Well, you can forget that because today that physics is going to come in handy. Imagine the scenario where this red ball is approaching this wall at some angle. And we're trying to figure out what is that ball going to look like after it bounces and comes off. In physics, we use a free body diagram to demonstrate such an event. I want you to imagine that the ball has started over here at P and is heading towards the wall and is going to hit the wall at point O. If we draw a line that's perpendicular to the wall here called the normal line, we see that the angle of incidence is going to be defined as this theta sub i. An important physics principle is that the angle of incidence is always going to be equal to the angle of reflection. That means that the ball is going to bounce off the wall and head towards Q with the same exact angle as it approached the wall. We're going to be making use of this principle frequently in our game. Let's take a look at a more specific example of a trajectory. Imagine this ball is heading upwards and to the right and is going to strike the ceiling shown in black. Imagine further that we define this trajectory to be five units to the right and three units up for every time the ball gets a chance to move. We can show this with little vectors here with 5 being the directional vector with the ball has to the right and 3 being the directional vector that the ball has upward. Now, question. After the ball has bounced off the wall, what will be its trajectory in the downward direction? Hopefully you will agree that the downward trajectory will now be 3 units down, but the trajectory moving to the right will remain at a plus 5. Here's a similar scenario where the ball is moving to the right and is about to strike the wall. Imagine that the movement in the right-hand direction is 3 and the vector downward happens to be 5. Make a mental note to yourself as what the vector will be after it bounces off the wall. Another important concept for our game is the idea of collision detection. We want to be able to tell when two sprites, in this case the ball and either the ceiling or one of the walls, or perhaps the paddle at the bottom of our game, has come into direct contact with one another. When this happens, we obviously want the ball to bounce. But we have to first figure out when the two objects have collided. How are we going to do this? One way that gamers often try and figure out when two objects have collided is by using something called a bounding box. What they do is they put a rectangle around each sprite, and then we can use some simple mathematics to figure out when the two rectangles are intersecting. Typically, all that's needed is the corner values of each of the rectangles, and a simple math equation lets us figure out when such a collision has occurred. But there is a problem with this approach. Imagine the scenario depicted here, where the projectile is extremely close to, but not yet touching the paddle on the bottom. The human eye can clearly detect that there is sunlight between the two. However, if we use the bonding box approach, we will register a false positive. It's going to say that there is a detection of a collision even though there actually is no collision. We can fix this problem by making the simplifying assumption in our game that the projectile is instead of being a circle, a simple square. This way, our bounding box will align perfectly with the actual sprite itself and we will not get such false positives in our game. And now, in the final portion of our tutorial, Let's talk a little bit about the keyboard. If we're running an Android app and there's a text box on the screen and we click inside of it, the operating system is smart enough to bring up the keyboard for entry. But in our Pong game, we want the keyboard present all the time. 
In addition, there is no text box or other input device that signals to the operating system that the keyboard is required. How then can we make sure that the keyboard is present all the time? Well, it turns out that by adding a single line of code to the manifest file, we can ensure that the virtual keyboard will be present throughout the game playing experience. In addition, we're going to be using something called key press events for the first time. We're going to program the Q key and the W key to allow the paddle, one of our sprites in the game, to be moved left and right when they're pressed. The key press event allows ours to trigger a certain block of code when each of these keys is pressed. This basically concludes our tutorial of the basic gaming concepts that we're going to be using in the development of this Pong game. Now let's get right on to the coding. Music